welcome everyone to be back to our podcast, The Videoers. And then this is going to be a very special episode. A、uh, lot of things different from the previous episode, because this will be the first time that we have invited the academic people to join our podcast, talking about、uh, video technologies. And it will be very.、Uh, actually, it's a. I have been really looking forward to this episode. First, I introduce my、uh, co-host Thomas, and he has he he must be very familiar because he already been in one of our existing episode. And then, so today、uh, we have Professor Maggie from Profess、uh, from Purdue University at West Lafayette, and we also has her student Ji Hao to join us. And it's very interesting episode in another meaning that Professor Maggie joined us from the east coast of the United States, and then her student Zhi Hao right now、um, is visiting China, visiting Shanghai. So he is joining us、uh, in Beijing time.、Uh, actually, we need to congratulate to Zhi Hao because he just got married. And then I also、uh, Thomas joined us from London, and I'm here right now in the Bay Area. Following observing the Pacific time, so right now we are actually really widely spreaded. So you can see that I'm here in the morning,、uh, very, and then we have London right now into the afternoon.、Uh, East Coast actually ready, very bright morning, and then it's late evening in the Beijing time. So it's really show that、uh, we are very globally distributed in our podcast. So today we're going to again talking about video compression. And actually, about AI applied to video compression. But first of all, I like to have the two our guests to have some introduction about themselves. So Maggie,、uh, thank you Zoe for the introduction. So hi everyone,、uh, I'm Maggie Zhu. So I'm a associate professor with the Alma Family School of Electrical and Computer Engineering at Purdue University, the West Lafayette campus.、Uh, very nice meeting everyone、uh, in this、uh, format. It is my first time. Um, but I really look forward to it.、Um, so our group mainly、uh, work on research topics related to image processing, computer vision,、uh, video compression, as well as digital health. And the topic that we would like to discuss today、uh, is a little bit special. It is more of a emerging、uh, area and、uh, known as、uh, coding for machines.、Um, so the idea here is that. Uh, more traditionally, we think about、uh, multimedia signals, not just、uh, videos. It can be speech, audio, images, or even uh, uh, point clouds, light fields. These type of signals that have mainly been acquired, processed, and compressed for the purpose of human use, right?、Um, but however,、uh, because of the increase of、uh, a majority of the internet connections and then traffics are now more dedicated to、uh, from the machine to machine、uh, type of framework.、Um, so, how do we address this issue with increased data communication across network? And、uh, if it is served,、uh, if it is for the purpose of automated machine analysis,、um, then how do we think about this? A new problem, and how do we think about in terms of video compression? So this will be、uh, the topic that we're going to discuss today. So I'll leave、uh, Let Jihao to introduce himself now. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, uh, hi everyone. Uh, this is Jihao.、Um, I'm a PhD student, the third year PhD、uh, in Professor Zhu's group. And so, as Professor Professor Zhu said, we work on、uh, various things. And for me,、uh, I work on like.、Uh, Like coding plus AI, so in two ways. So, so we have coding with AI, so we can use like AI techniques to facilitate to improve coding performance, and we have coding for AI, so、uh, we can des design coding algorithms specifically for AI or algorithms, but not for humans. So,、uh, this is my research scope.、Yeah. Well, thanks. And、um, you are still in your honeymoon, and、um, <laughs> oh. Uh, I like to、um, uh, add a little bit more because、um, we invite Maggie and Jihao, and then we we need to congratulate them, congratulate them that they actually just won the best algorithm paper award、uh, in the just finished on the early January of this year、uh, in the WACV conference 
and think they can talk about it a little bit because it's actually the paper draw the attention to us because the paper is also talking about as uh, introduced by our guest uh, applying AI technologies to video compression and our image compression in the large. Um, it uh, has been, we also have episodes talking about how AI can be applied to video codec because uh, right now machine learning has been widely uh, applied to everywhere, especially recently there's a wave about talking about chat GPT. And so um, there's uh, AI machine learning can be applied to every, almost every aspect. But for image and video compressions, uh, I think our guys also touched that point. It's a very complicated, relatively complicated procedure. We also have prior guests talking about, there's a lot of research ongoing, but a lot of people also hesitating that whether uh, machine learning or AI would ever be applied, will ever show advantages compared to the traditional uh, 2D transform plus motion estimation and compensation platform. We talk a little bit of deep tech here. So basically uh, image and video compression has uh, a traditional framework that has been applied for all these many years. I think since uh, the very old codec standard to the most recent one, uh, for example, we we now know that H.264, AVC, and then H.265, HEVC, now um, VVC, the ACA H.266, and, and the other trend lines for open media that have AV1. Uh, all these video codec standard uh, produce different formats, but underlying they actually follow very similar framework. The image compression similar um, there's uh, transforms applied to the images, uh, block-based prediction are being applied. So there's a traditional framework that has been leveraged down there, but how AI can, or machine learning, can be applied down there. I think Jihao just mentioned a very important uh, uh, idea is that uh, sometimes image or video compression, not just uh, making compression of the images to be seen by human eyes, but also can be uh, applied for the ultimate goal for the image to be consumed by machines. Uh, first of all, I think Jihao, you can talk a little bit about uh, the title of your paper and the main uh, theme of the paper that you have just won the best uh, paper award. Actually, you also have one more paper that's won uh, at least enter the top five best paper finalists for the December conference picture of coding symposium, uh, short as PCS. I believe PCS right now is one of the most prestigious video and image compression conferences uh, in academia as well as in the industry. So can you talk a little bit about your, the best paper work that you've done? Also, you just mentioned that there is uh, uh, motion learning applied to uh, image code that part that for the sake for uh, the image to be seen by the machines instead of my human eyes. Yeah, so we have two papers uh, published in the last two months. And uh, so as we said, there are two, we have two scopes. So one is coding for AI and another is coding with AI. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, maybe let me, uh, talk about them one by one. So let's talk about the coding for AI. So uh, so in this problem, so we are interested in, um, we want to design a coding algorithm that is optimized for um, like for AI algorithms to execute on the bitstream, but not for humans to look at the reconstruction. So if we, uh, if we look at like all, the, all of the traditional codecs, like for images, we have like JPEG, JPEG 2000, BPG, etc. For videos, we have like H.264, H.256, AV1, and VP9, etc. So all of them are like compressing videos to as few bits as possible, and um, they want to reconstruct the 
image or video to the pixel to pixels to their original form and we want to we want them to have a good visual quality so but this uh like this is very like normal in the past like 20 years but like but now um many video and many images i believe uh, many data on the internet they are transmitted um not for human to look at but they are um used for machines to analyze for example um let's say we have a drone we have a like uh, unmanned uh, aerial vehicle uh, uav like it is uh like uh it is operating on the sky and it captures it, there is a camera in it it captures some videos and we want to do some like let's say object recognition on it so um the way it works is it captures video and it it needs to transmit the video to the back end uh it may be a edge uh edge uh server or it may be a cloud server so uh we want to do it because like running an ai algorithm on the like on that uh, machine sorry on that uav is expensive in terms of like power um so we really want to like compress it into bits and transmit into the back end for analysis and on the back end there's no human to look at that video there's only like ai algorithm to analyze it so in this case um we, re we really don't don't care about the reconstruction psnr we always the metric we always use in video compression we, we really don't care about it um, in compression, we we just care about the AI algorithm's accuracy in the back end. So, yeah. So uh, this is what we call uh, AI. Sorry, coding for AI uh, problem. And we have one paper on this. And the second scope we care about is uh, coding with AI. So, as Zoe said, uh, like in the past, like decades, um, we like virtually all of the codecs are based on transform coding and yeah so in the past few decades like uh to my best knowledge virtually all of the uh, codecs for images for videos they are based on transform coding so there is a let's say dct or dwt like a discrete discrete cosine transform a discrete wavelet transform um there's a transform that transforms the pixels into the frequency domain and we quantize and code the frequency coefficients uh, instead so of pixels. Do these, do these, sorry to interrupt but, you, but yeah. do these AI algorithms work in yeah, yeah, sure. sort of similar ways or are they a generalization of this kind of architecture? Do they have things like quantization and approximation in, in them? Yeah, that's a very good point. So I I would say it's it works a similar way, but it's, uh more generalized because um if we think about the essence of compression so the uh how compression works is that we can find like frequent patterns and infrequent infrequent patterns and we assign fewer bits to frequent patterns and uh more bits to infrequent patterns and so that is like how entropy coding works and it is also like the uh like the fundamental of the fun the, the foundation of how compression works so yeah yeah, yeah so I, I think you know one one of the the challenge with the traditional coding um is because there's a lot of uh parameters to tune right and uh, it is almost like a an art that you have to master um, and uh, it becomes very uh, difficult for someone to even try, you know, to get into um, the area um, because they will say, hey, here is the latest, greatest um, a standard that you can use, right? And then, you know, go use it, but how, right? So there's a lot of uh, a training that is involved, which is uh, it, it is a lot of engineering design into it, um, and it is very dependent on the different applications, right? So that's why you have many different configurations, different kind of modes that are being introduced in the traditional Kodak, uh, because it is tailored uh, to achieve that best RD, um, you know, for the type of uh, applications or even content oriented. 
right? Um, so I think this is a one thing where AI uh, techniques could uh, help or, you know, of course, this is just one aspect of it, right? Um, but if you can learn something about this data, it needs to be compressed, whether it's image, video or something else. But now it has the leisure of large scale data sets. Right. So this is something, um, you know, machine learning can leverage is from the large scale data set, then you can perhaps, you know, alleviate some of these burden on having to try to manually uh, find what would be, you know, the best solution for your particular application or the particular content. Um, and if you think about it, this is not really a brand new idea, right? Because, for example, uh, even looking at uh, works such as quality metrics, right? There's the VM, VFM, and and then the reason why is because it sort of also knows about when PSNR works better, when SSIM works better, or when uh, VIF works better. So, uh, so again, it is leveraging on you know having seen a lot of different data and then knowing you know when one in what scenario would you use what type of parameters. So I think uh, this is you know one of the advantage. Uh, of uh, introducing or including some of these machine learning and AI techniques uh, in, in, in the coding pipeline. Uh, so that's just, you know, my two cents. Would, would you say in these types of um, applications, these machine to machine applications, there's maybe a different kind of balance? I mean, traditionally video codecs have been uh, designed around a sort of one to many architecture. Mm -hmm. I mean, video conferencing is, a, is, is one to one, but um, you know, in, in, in VOD, you have a single encoder that can be very expensive because it's serving many thousands of decoders. So the balance is many decoders, a single encoder. Um, but are, you know, are these applications more where it might be the other way around, that there might be um, many encoders and a single decoder, something like surveillance or security or those kind of applications? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So uh, that raised a very interesting point, Thomas, um, because if you think about it, it really depends on what kind of, uh, uh, you know, applications and then the type of hardware you're working with, right? Because we're talking about things, machines that have huge uh, GPU capabilities, right? So, you know, encoding, expensive encoding. That's fine, right? As long as you know it, 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 it gives you you know the the accuracy or the rate that you're you're desiring. That's okay. But then you also have very very small devices where it may only have a little bit capability for a couple of neural network layers, right? So what do we do in this situation? We can't you know spend a lot of uh, complexity built into you know the encoder side um, because of what it can support. Uh, so there there is I think a lot of uh, dynamics uh, adaptability uh, that the system needs to be built, and that's one of the reason why uh, if you look at it. Uh, the the different uh, standard work like the MPAC JPEG, they have been uh, quite active uh, forming these ad hoc groups looking at um, you know video coding for machines for example with MPAC and there's an AI ad hoc group you know with JPEG too because uh, essentially this becomes quite challenging to think about from a standardization point of view right um, so so yeah there's a lot of I think interesting work that uh, needs to happen uh, not just you know for us who are in academia think about well you know how do we best solve this problem how do we design the algorithm that you know can serve these different purposes but also from the more engineering or the industry point of well you know if we have this great algorithm how do we deploy you know in our system in our devices right um, so I think uh, it's um, although it, it's very exciting, but it is also very complex uh, and although a very difficult problem. Yeah, I think uh, that's why we're talking here because there's a lot of suspicions actually from the industry that one, well, whether the use of machine learning or AI can ever benefit the codec world, image codecs or video codecs, but talking with you guys previously, and we learned that uh, sometimes, uh, for example, here, Jiha talked a lot about transforms. I heard you once mentioned that at one time you were trying to get some new algorithms for transform and then submit some paper to in the academia area. And then mm -hmm. some reviewers challenged that uh, 
you should put the transform within the real Kodak framework and then do some benchmark to show the advantages of the algorithms. But indeed, um, image and video Kodak, uh, if you really want to go down as what standardization, what the industry are trying to evaluate, uh, it could be hard because um, there is kind of a complicated. So if you design some new algorithm, how, for example, you have some new algorithm and then you are seems like obligated to put that module within the whole framework and that takes time. So what do you think uh, how the academia can really advance some algorithms without actually being hindered by a lot of seems the industrial criteria because we need pioneer work from the academia so that I can guide or give us some insights uh, eventually and benefit uh, the, for example, the code in the industry. But on the other side, the industry has a lot of suspicions. And then so they want to put a lot of policies or rules, hoping the academic paper follows some benchmarking. So what do you think? Um, yes, so first of all, that's a very good point. Um, so I do agree, uh, like the learning curve for Kodak is very, uh, is very long. Uh, so at, at uh, once I was looking into the BBC Kodak, um, but the document uh, was like more than 50 pages and it's very dense. And, uh, the, and it took me for like several days to, uh, to run it for the first time to like learn the documents and run it for the first time. So, so yeah, so it do have a like long learning curve. And regarding the- Well, that, that also doesn't include making changes, right? So, um, sorry for the inter interruption. I just want to make a point. So Zoe mentioned about the story I, I told her about, you know, uh, this, uh, it's not actually our group's work. It was someone that I know also uh, been working in, in this area for a long time, but no longer as active because, um, you know, they, they want to propose something new and, uh, uh, and this particular still within the traditional framework of, let's say, perhaps a new block transfer, right? Um, but the problem is that, you know, anytime you want to make a change, you know, to the transform, it is the core, right? So that means that everything else down downstream will, you know, have to, you know, be changed. And uh, um, how do you do that, right? Uh, how do you signaling? How do you do entropy codings? So all of that's not going to fit in the existing, you know, uh, block-based transform uh, paradigm, you know, in any modern codec. So it, it's, it's, I think it's because how everything is so uh, related, um, you know, a small change in one place, perhaps, you know, you would imagine it's a small change. It could mean that many, many change in other places. And, you know, as academias, we publish papers and we get reviewers and then review has different background. Now, if they don't necessarily come from, you know, the, the, the coding community, they may not understand. They could say, well, you know, yes, you know, this looks good. Mathematically, you proved it. It's better, you know, than existing ones. Uh, but, you know, I can't see, you know, this uh, uh, battery savings. I don't see, you know, the, 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 the RD curves. I don't see your, your BDPSNR, right? So, but in order to do that, you have to put in an existing uh, uh, coding framework uh, to, to be able to show that. So I think that's where, from the academic point of view, it's, it's hindering. And that's why uh, people who might be, you know, working on this uh, for, for a while and then just, you know, feel hopeless. Um, so that's one aspect. And uh, that, you know, I, I just kind of wanted to point out that the, the challenge is not necessary because in academics, we only wanted to pursue, you know, papers and then we don't care about, you know, how we could um, trans, like, um, I would say it's more of like, a, a, how, how, how do we deliver what we, you know, think is great uh, into a, a actual product or deployment, right? Or even before that, to have people agree with that, with that what is right uh, or what is, you know, whether it's a potential uh, a pathway. Um, so I think it's important. Uh, we, 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 need, uh, we, we need understanding uh, from both sides. Yeah, so go ahead, Jaha. If I could just, yeah, um, one, one comment. Thomas, was, I mean, having 
been participating in standardization i would also say even within standardization it's very difficult to make changes because you are in a local optimum and there's mm -hmm. lots and lots of moving parts so i you know it's certainly very hard if you don't have the deep immersion in the in the codex standard you're you're developing um, or you're using but you can find something that should work doesn't work because um many things automatically adjust inside an encoder so it, it can be super hard i think one of the things that's really mm -hmm. attractive and interesting about some of this ai stuff is that in a sense it can be simpler that you have a lot of layers exactly. and then you have automatic training and it's the training that takes care of all the very complicated hand tuning that you've talked about um and and so that's mm -hmm. why there's maybe we would get a fundamentally different architecture for future standards that is that is much simpler and less and and yet more general with these kind of layered solutions yeah and um i think one of the thing uh, a little bit uh uh kind of a deviate from this but i, I think also is important um is uh, you know, we wanted to push for at many of these, you know, high profile conferences that we have, um, you know, attractions such as workshops, for example, or special sessions where we, uh, you know, attract people uh, from both academias and industry to meet and then to talk about these emerging areas, right? Both people from industry who think about how do I, you know, do this from the hardware point of view and people find standardized bodies and say, well, you know, this is how do we standardize this, right? So there needs to be opportunities and venues where people can come in together to talk about these things. Um, so that's, uh, sort of, I think, another uh, 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 a way to bring people together. So I think the, the challenge here is sometimes it's difficult, right? People work in industries who work with products, they go to certain conferences, they go to certain meetings, um, but academic people, we go to academic conference. So there is not a lot of opportunity um, to talk uh, and chat about this. So I think that also, you know, needs to have a better environment uh, to, to make sure that these emerging topics can be discussed. We can see the different challenges early on so people can work on these together. Yeah, so you basically take the request from the industry and then can really just be aware of what mm -hmm. the real issue down there and provide a solution from academia. And yeah. that, that, that's very needed. Um, but back to, because uh, we all talk about uh, like there's quite some challenges down there overall. And then back to our original topic that we talk about the best paper that you just won in the WACV. Because this conference, uh, in my impression, that is one of the, I think is one of the top also computer vision conferences. And there's only one, I think they have two tracks, algorithms and applications, right? So there's one paper of each track, um, but the majority uh, actually submitted the papers were on in the track of algorithm, and you won the best paper of um, the algorithm track. Uh, in one sense, because this is a computer vision conference, but the best algorithm paper actually is focused on codec. So we do see that at least in this trend, AI applies to codec actually draws this uh, majority attention. So I'm just curious, uh, back to the paper itself, what kind of algorithm in general that you proposed and what results that you presented to show some promising for the AI plus codec topic? Yeah, so uh, first of all, thank you for uh, like introducing our paper. So, um, so in that paper, we, um, uh, so we first identify the relationship between uh, like compression or coding mm -hmm. with like uh, generative model. So generative model is a kind of uh, uh, AI model that learns the distribution of data. So um, it, uh, so it, it, it is fundamentally related to coding and compression because both of them aims to find patterns in the data. Oh. 
So I hope this made sense. Um, but so I just want to I, I just want to highlight that the introduction of AI um, brings like uh, a very uh, uh, so, sorry. Let me do it again. Um, sure. So yeah. So I just want to uh, highlight that uh, AI bridges the gap between many fields, including coding and mm -hmm. computer vision and machine learning. So I think like maybe in the future we can see that there is a single method for both coding uh, or compression mm -hmm. and image generating. For example, uh, I think so I guess maybe we know the diffusion models, the stable diffusion, like the AI art models. Um, so like uh, one, uh, sorry. Uh, Professor G, like, uh, no, no worries. Yeah, because um, there's a lot of curiosity. They they are just yeah. uh, from the yeah. industry, also from the community. Yeah, because yeah, because I think there are like a lot of technical stuff, and I don't know like what's well. So so okay. So maybe yeah. So maybe one way to think about this um, is um, I mean the goal here. If you look at so the, for this particular paper, um, you know what we proposing are to. Uh, kind of think about coding from the point of a very a variational autoencoder, and that's you know one type of uh, generative probabilistic model. Okay, and then as Jihan says that it can learn the statistical distributions from the data. So in our case, that would be images. And we actually did it for image. We have not quite done it for video yet because you know as you all know that much more complicated because there's also a lot of redundancies uh, uh, in the time domain right so that's something uh, yes we're uh, working on uh, uh, the original paper uh, in this conference is more focusing on the image right mm -hmm. uh, so if you think about it, um, it, it it all it tries to do is how do I transform data from the pixel domain to some kind of uh, latent feature space Right, but that if you think of it that way, it's really quite similar to in the traditional coding, the transform coding, right? But it is is done in a way that, um, and then what we are able to show is that um, using this variational autoencoders, we can learn the rate distortion function of the data, um, and which is you know quite fundamental um, for you know lossy compression. So I think this is where uh, it brings a new insight. Uh, to the community and for people, I think in, in as mentioned, uh, as Zoe mentioned, this is a, a computer vision conference, right? So the audience are familiar with very vari variation autoencoder. So we're not proposing, you know, a new uh, neural network architecture or anything. And it has been show really great for you know generating um, things, you know, or transform from one type of things to something else, right? So, so these has been show, but I guess what's new is people haven't think about its relationship to transform coding, for example. Right, but because we, you know, work in the in, work on compression, we see there is that connection, um, and then um, so I think that's where uh, this paper got uh, noticed, and people uh, appreciate, you know, this new insight that we brought to the community. So, so what kind of interested yeah, me think... was the connection you made there between you know, the 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 older, thick kind of fixed architecture that compression has and and this this sort of more general model so if i'm understanding it rightly these kind of generative auto encoders work by creating a set of what you call latent variables which you can use to um to to then generate an image at the other end so it's kind of some some kind of hidden space in the middle and that's what you want to approximate and that's what you want to do dimensional reduction on and that's what you want to transmit and then th this is what a decoder can use to generate your um your image or your video so you kind of have a matched pair of encoder Features. and decoder exactly. with with this these uh, coefficients or variables in the middle. And that does sound very like conventional compression. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then uh, you're right. And the other, um, I think, a contribution we have um, is uh, if you think about it, 
um, the uh, so in the uh, 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 variation of autoencoder, um, in order because we, we still have to do entropy coding, right? Because um, otherwise, um, this latent uh, feature that we get from the VAE it's continuous, right? So the entropy coding won't work. So that's another thing that and to how uh, worked on um, to. A sort of uh, update or modify the configuration, and this is particularly with you know the posterior and the, and the prior distribution part that um, he has modified so that it can support entropy coding and make you know sort of this end-to-end -end, uh, uh, lossy compression um, possible uh, for you know building on this uh, uh, variation of autoencoder. Uh, so I think um, this is where uh, you know uh, we we kind of. This something people feel that is quite interesting and brings new insights. Yeah. Um, and so feel free to elaborate more. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, so uh, basically that's exactly what we do. And um, so w one thing I want to highlight is that like our, so the method de developed from the pers pers sorry, perspective of like generative like version auto encoders is very similar to that of transform coding. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. so as we said, it's a generalization of the transform coding because, um, so one way to think of it is that, for example, in JPEG, we have a uh, DCT and a inverse DCT. And actually there are like many types of DCTs we can, and when, for example, when de designing a codec, we want to choose one type of transform over others and um, but uh, we may think like why choosing this over others so um, if we recall uh, d like DCT or other linear transforms it's just a uh, matrix transform and that matrix is uh, contains a bunch of param parameters and what we can do is like why not we just learn the parameters like use machine learning techniques so, and if we make this um, transform like very complex, it's, it becomes deep learning and it becomes a kind of deep autoencoder. And uh, yeah, and so by doing this, like we simplify the pro, like we simplify manual work because we don't, uh, we don't need to like try different uh, uh, transform configurations and we just need to set a objective and we just let the entire system learn the parameters itself and it hopefully learns a very uh, decent transform. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so this is one way to think of, to think of you know, the autoencoders and the traditional transform coding so, uh, methods. Uh, would you uh, before that, I think we talked about the autoencoder is on the computer vision feed field. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, different yeah. from the encoder concept in the codec field. Go ahead. I was Thanks. just going to ask, I mean, you're talking about learning these parameters. Is this something that happens online as part of the encoding process? Or do you do some, or is this in a sort of pre-trained situation? So could this system adapt in, in real time to the data that it's getting, or does it need to be trained? Yeah, that's uh, very insightful. Um, so typically what we do is the pre-trained uh, like method so we just we have a model we have a huge data set we just train the model on the data set and we use it like, and we keep it fixed forever this is what we typically do but there are indeed uh, papers and like novel techniques um, like uh, doing it online so what we could do is that first so once we have a model and once we are s like seeing new data and we can design some algorithms such that if the model uh, finds the new data follow a specific specific pattern, for example, it finds the like the incoming data are all screen data or all face images, then it can update its parameters to adapt to that model. And of course, like uh, this is done in encoder, uh, the encoding side, and on the decoding side, we need some time to do the same thing, so that the encoder and decoder match each other. So yes, uh, I guess. This is one of the like uh, a promising yeah, future. I, I remember some time ago there was an MPEG project called Reconfigurable Video Coding, where the idea mm -hmm. was that you sent a description of your algorithm as part of the bitstream, 
and you could update it and you can produce a rate distortion model that includes the entropy of your decoder algorithm as well as the data itself um, but having this kind of general framework of um, uh, video of video processing where you are just sending weights of different layers and those those kind of things that have been pre-trained that does open a lot of interesting possibilities to to send updated weights to decoders you know as part of bit streams and sometimes adapt sometimes not adapt yes it is so i would not say it's a, a like more general method like in ai but i would say it's a very similar method so in like ai based coding there are, are indeed methods that uh transmit uh, like the weights of the model in the bit stream and so in, on the encoder side, we, for example, what we can do is to, we just like overfit one model on an image and we transmit the weights to the decoder side. So, so using the weights, the decoder can like perform very well on that, on this single image. So this is what we could do. And some people tried that and um, they, that they got decent results. I, I would not say like, State of the art or very promising, but they got decent results. And um, but like I would say, it's a very interesting and uh, like promising future direction in my view. Uh, can I learn? For example, we talk about this is promising. So what is the current performance compared to the traditional? Because you're doing image code for this paper and one the best algorithm. So I want to see. Uh, I think a lot of audience was also want to see what's the current result using this AI codec algorithm. What's the compression? Because we talk about codec. I think the image, uh, we all know that we want to see to achieve the best quality, best possible quality, and then to have the least or smallest file size or bit rate. And at the same time, there's also um, the computational cost underlying during the encoding process. So what's the current performance that based on your paper compared to the state of the art uh, image traditional codec results. Yeah, so in terms of the rate and distortion, um, our method is uh, slightly better than the VTM. So it's the reference f software for VDC. And slightly better. Uh, it's, it was 4% uh, BD rate, so it's only like marginally better. But in terms of like uh, efficiency or speed, like running mm -hmm. speed, uh, com computational complexity, like learning based methods are all very complex. So we require a GPU to run on, we have, a, we, we need a GPU to execute our program. Otherwise, if we run on CPU, uh, decoding a single, let's say, uh, 512 by 768 image mm -hmm. requires uh, around half a second. So it's, um, on it's intolerable uh, in many uh, like in many applications. Encoding or decoding? Just your uh, uh, just decoding, but decoding. Any, encoding is slower. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, so, so basically, you mentioned four percent at least, right? Meaning that to achieve the same quality, and then there's a four percent uh, uh, bit rate gain, meaning that you're smaller by four percent compared to, for example, state art of VVC results, the H two C four from. Side. but complexity is uh yeah is high. i would say it's yeah it's very high it's far from i would say it's uh, i would say intractable in uh like practical applications and yeah I, and that's a very uh huge problem for practical use uh of like learning based codecs and yeah right now uh, uh we are so, yeah, go ahead. For yeah. yeah, so um, so I think, you know, uh, one other thing I wanted to point out is, you know, in this process, we made an interesting discovery um, because uh, in essence, the decoding is progressive, right? Mm -hmm. um, so at a very low um, bit rate, uh, we can already sort of see, um, you know, in, in general, roughly what is the content, you know, in this frame, in this image. Okay, um, so I think this is, uh, you know, when, when you look at trade-off, I think it's important to know, and everybody knows that 
um, these you know ne neural network based uh, compression is um, expensive because of the trainings and, and and all of that. But I think that is not something can be uh, necessarily uh, improved purely based on algorithms and software. Okay, um, because that would also need hardware support and all of that. So that is something uh, I think I have confidence uh, that can be addressed uh, down the road. Just maybe not right now. But what else? I mean, what we the, this interesting phenomenon, finally, you know, this is this progressive decoding, right? So essentially, you know, it depending on what the application scenarios are, right? We could. Uh, basically tailor this framework for different application scenarios. So we touched a little bit on, you know, this concept of coding for machines, right? So at that, uh, if this is, you know, what our target application is, then perhaps we don't need, you know, at, you know, very high, you know, uh, bit rate to support because we're not that, that interested in the pixel reconstruction aspect, right? If we can get um, the features, the content, um, from the images or the video that is indeed needed for some downstream vision task, uh, then we're fine, right? So in that sense, it could uh, support uh, these different uh, scenarios. Uh, depends on you know what we use for. So I think um, there is also the that aspect of uh, you know generalization and then you know how can it be applicable for the different uh, application scenarios. And that aspect I think is also important. And to consider for this work so as well. In, compa in comparing these, I think this is a great point. That in, in comparing these these kind of algorithms wow. with um, traditional compression algorithms, um, you're kind of fighting on on your on your enemy's ground, as it were, because that you're being assessed on uh, pixel matched image metrics like PSNR or SSIM, which require perfect alignment. Mm -hmm. Would it be possible to get big gains and exactly. complexity reductions if you had to produce something that looked very similar but wasn't necessarily aligned in terms of the actual locations, exact locations of pixels and so on? Is there a degree of freedom that maybe you're not exploiting right now? Yeah, I, I agree. So Go ahead, John. Yeah, there is one... Uh, small area of research in learned image coding is mm -hmm. that generative ima image compression. So the objective is not to exactly re reconstruct the pixels, but to uh, reconstruct the pixels in ter like to achieve good perceptual quality. Mm -hmm. So one, so one like very trivial or very simple example for this is to use like AI generative models. For example, if we have a uh, image of grass, and we just save it save it as a text of uh, a text uh, consisting a, uh, a consisting like a prompt saying an Im image of class, and in the decoder side, we just use a, a like AI generative model to generate a arbitrary grass image, and then like if we look at the image, I mean. I mean, the perceptual quality is like very high, but it's just not the original image. So that is one. Uh, so in some applications, it it, it may be good. Um, yeah. So. Yeah, and and then you know, uh, I I'm sure Zoe now remembers we actually work on something like that, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, um, this is the combining compression and synthesis. So what uh, Jihao mentioned that uh, you get some certain information, and through the learning, you identified actually get some knowledge regarding the detailed content, and they use the synthesis on the decoder or the, uh, the player side to synthesize those textures. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Actually, I, I think this is very great topic that uh, because based on what you find out in your paper, uh, Maggie and Jihao just mentioned that there's a progressive decoding. So I see actually at least the three benefit from progressive dec decode, uh, progressive decoding that we just discussed. For example, one is uh, some of this video codec or image codec applications, not just for humans, but for machine. Because we compress the big amount of data, and finally we just want to communicate 
or get data shared and finally to be processed by machines. So machine may not need that perfect reconstruction as long as some information that can be extracted is made good enough for machine, like what Dr. Thomas mentioned. And secondly is uh, maybe sometimes we don't have enough bit rates, right? So sometimes we have very low bandwidth. The situation of the network is not as good, but it still get some information, even for human eyes. And then uh, just now we also mentioned that potentially because of progressive decoding, it can potentially combine with some synthesis uh, work that actually reconstruct some images or videos on the decoder side will actually at least present a great info, even though may not be completely fade out to the original source. So then that means that there need some new metric, right? Exactly. And how do we evaluate the, 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 the performance of that works? Uh, any new like trends uh, in academia right now? Because Tom just mentioned that you actually force your work has to be compared against the existing work using PS9, using ISIM. That's basically pixel by pixel. You just like original data, just reconstruct data. You try to compare them uh, bit by bit to evaluate uh, the result of this work. Any, some other works about along this line? Um, I think right now this is uh, still at its infancy. So we know a lot of, you know, great people working, you know, on uh, qualities, on metrics, and then it hasn't quite, I guess, get enough attraction on this topic uh, to have people, you know, think about work on that. But, you know, you're right. So that's one of the reason why I'm, you know, uh, advocating, you know, uh, to have both the academia and, and then uh, that's, you know, my familiar territory to bring people together, right? To, to try to say, hey, here is a really cool, we have a lot of new idea, we've done some, you know, groundwork and then we've seen, you know, some promising things that could happen. Now, you know, how can people who understands about standardization, how can people understand about the qualities can help us think about you know these because this needs to be addressed like you said you know we're still using the same old metric for evaluation right and then that may not be fair because we're playing other people's um uh, uh playground in their sandbox um so we need you know something new um so yeah so this is all uh, i think will be happening very soon um we've seen you know quite uh, a lot of other groups around the world that are interested in this province um, and uh, hopefully, you know, with a little bit more critical mass, we can move this forward a little bit faster. Well, thanks for the sharing. Actually, I think right now we have talked quite a bit and in sometimes we didn't talk about quite some deep technology and algorithms. So I'm here try to ramp up this, uh, uh, even though we still have a lot of things, I'm actually really enjoyed. And I, I like to actually for the first time to have each of you uh, to at least uh, share something about your thoughts on AI or machine learning on Kodak. And uh, I may want to go to Maggie first. And then because for here you are a professor and then you can have many topics to explore. And then I, I know that from the website and then from uh, the bio of the paper and you have touched a lot of areas and then Motion learning to Kodak. What's your thought? And that's just one point, good enough. Yeah, so, um, you know, I, I think to me, um, there was a great paper <laughs> by what? Professor Ed Delp that um, talk about, so the question at the time, that was not really too long ago, I think uh, maybe less than 10 years ago, and people think compression is dead, right? Um, mm -hmm. So he and a couple of others wrote a paper and said that's not the case. So at that time, of course, machine learning hasn't becoming as um, popular or as of, you know, trend, trending topic yet. Um, but it was at, a, you know, sort of a, a dark place for academia because there is no work left for be the academia to do, except yes, there are small problems. There are certain applications we can work on, but you know, there's, you know, from a point of view from, you know, academic contributions to the community, it becomes very difficult, 
right? Um, and then this also is related to how do we find students that are interested in working on this problem? How do we find funding agency sponsors to sponsor the work, right? But now, you know, with this growing trend of AI and machine learning, uh, and, you know, I've been asked, so I have some industry experience, and at a time, you know, since people know that I have some compressions, they always ask, what's different? Right, what can be new and then, you know, groundbreaking. And I don't have an answer at a time. But now I think as we start to pick up the work in this space again, I see hope. Um, and uh, I, and then this is to me, um, you know, where really, you know, I'm very interested. I do a lot of things, but this is something that is to me a uh, very hold closer to my heart um, just because of where my training comes from. Right. Um, so I do hope that we can attract. We need more people. We need more people who are interested in working on this problem. And we need people who have different domain experts so that we can answer all these hard questions that we talked about today. Um, so that's my two cents. Wow. Yeah, we see. Oh, we're all looking forward to the future, basically. <laughs> and then back to Thomas, because uh, you have been actually working this area, especially for standardization and from uh, HEDC to AV1, and then um, you have highly, uh, like heavily involved in the standardization, but you also have involved in the Kodak product for all these many years. So what do you think about I, I think it's really exciting, and I think we touched um, really on one of the, the sort of the key roadblock at the moment is metrics to assess the true potential of these algorithms. I think we don't have a really good metric for subjective quality. Um, we and there's lo been lots of good work, say with VMAP and so on, for um, trying to assess thing, things things better. But they're they're still kind of pixel mapped, and for a long time people have been wanting to introduce synthesis algorithms into compression. So I think that's one route to a kind of hybrid ML non ML um, uh, kind of kind of codec, um, but. The other thing that is really exciting is these very general autoencoder architectures that can introduce at least not comp computational simplicity, but conceptual simplicity into this whole space when our codec standards have got very, very complex and hard to optimize. So I see these, these, two, um, these two major features that, that mm -hmm. you know, will progress in, in the next few years. Well, thank you. You're talking about the complexity of the Codex as well as we do need a, a, a metric. I think talking about metrics is one more common that because uh, VMAP seems at least right now has been widely used, which was originally proposed by the Netflix team. Actually, it's also leveraged machine learning. So actually, when we try to evaluate machine learning applied to Codex and we need a metric, again, we may rely on the machine learning uh, development to find out a Codec or objective codec that we are talking about to be really leverage the subject, which is a human eyes justification, or maybe not aligned with the human eyes justification, but aligned justification from the machine side. So uh, there's a lot of machine learning actually involved that I see. Uh, and last, but of course not least, Jihao, I'd like to have your opinion because again, you are the third year student into the PhD program. Now I have to say that it's a, it's a very, what you've done has been very impressive. And that you won a best paper finalist as a first author. And then again, for this year, we're talking about that WACV and you won, uh, you with your co-authors, won the best algorithm paper, again, you as the first author. So uh, not only just for the direction of AI, but collab, I want to talk a little bit like you have some sort about your career that you think about academia, industry, and what do you think? Uh, uh, of course, uh, related to what the work you have been doing or you are going to continue to work on AI plus Kodak. So what do you think you foresee your future? Uh, maybe not too much, three to five years? Yeah, so for me personally, uh I am more interested in a, a academic um, position because, um, I, uh, because I, I, I kind of I, I, I enjoy like doing research. I enjoy like exploring new things, mm -hmm. and but um, 
so for like industry uh i also like I engineering i also like, like tuning parameters and make things work so it's very important it made it's uh it is what made the world like work um yeah so like both of them are very very like interesting but um for me i just um uh like so when when i was a child i I just uh, I wanted to be a teacher, so like I I will, uh, <laughs> uh, I personally like uh, prefer like an academic job uh, like more. Yeah, yeah, you really enjoy like you want to be a teacher, and then also you want to do the research. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's And true. then, what do you think of the research direction of AI plus Kodak? So, um, so there are like like many uh like interesting and promising like directions so i would say um in general there are, are three for codex plus ai there are um codex as we as we said there are codex with ai so mm -hmm. we use we want we can use like ai techniques to improve codex there are codex for ai we can like design codex like coding algorithms specifically for ai instead of mm -hmm. instead of human and there are another one, um, namely uh, codex of AI. So, so right right now AI models are very huge. It's very big, and there are an area, area of, of research that is like a coding of AI models themselves. So we are not coding images. We are not coding videos. We are coding the AI models, the weights of the AI models themselves. So uh, it's coding of AI, and so like. I think all of those three are very uh, interesting and promising, and they um, they might not be useful uh, in like in the current world, in the current uh, state. But um, I believe like maybe it's five years, maybe it's ten years, maybe it's twenty years. But like eventually, they will play a role in the industry. Yeah. Well, thank you. And actually, thanks everyone for getting to this. I think it's very exciting and insightful uh, episode. So we talk about the three things. Uh, just to echo what uh, Jiha just mentioned. So we talk about a uh, Kodak for AI, Kodak with AI, and Kodak of AI. And then, of course, there's a lot of work and a lot of hope and something to look forward to. So thanks to everybody and from a different uh, corner uh, of the world uh, that to join this episode. So um, and thank uh, thanks for the, our audience. Um, yeah, thank you, thank Zoe, you. for inviting and hosting us. And then thank you, uh, Thomas, for the great discussion. Thank you. It's really, really interesting. <laughs> thanks.